This video is brought to you by Squarespace, helping you make beautiful websites quickly and easily. Playing Final Fantasy is an exercise of love, but even the most ardent fans can agree the plots are full of what in academia we call what the fuck type moments. Are all Cloud's memories fake? Is that really how interdimensional time travel works? People might wonder, why is Sarah a crystal now? And my personal favorite, how is Titus a dream? Not that he is dreaming, Titus literally is a dream. You know how many people have played a Final Fantasy game? A lot. You know how many people can actually recount the plot of one of these games? Very few. Despite needlessly convoluted storytelling, the thing that fans latch on to is the wonderfully complex characters and their personal struggles. Even though each installment introduces a new cast, there's a significant amount of thematic overlap that ties these characters together and keeps the fans coming back for more. At its core, Final Fantasy is a series of games that explores the intricacies of dreams, desires, spiritual environmentalism, and, well, fantasy. I'm Jared, and this is Final Fantasy and Psychology. Part 1, Putting the PH in Fantasy. On one level, Final Fantasy is an exploration of the unconscious. It's a jaunt into the world of dreams. There's a difference between fantasy and the psychoanalytic concept of fantasy with a PH. What we traditionally think of as fantasy is something like daydreams, wishes, or desires, such as Vaughn's dreams of being a sky pirate in FF12, or Sid dreaming of being an astronaut in FF7, or Terra dreaming of her past in FF6. Fantasy with a PH is the unconscious drives behind our actions that we are unaware of, and throughout the series we often see physical manifestations of the unconscious. Titus is always dreaming about how much he hates his alcoholic father, I HATE YOU! And in the same game, Seymour makes the comment that he can smell the far plane on Orin. <laughs> The Far Plane is a sort of literary allusion to the Underworld or the Dream World. In Final Fantasy VI, they literally visit the Dream World, the Land of the Espers, and fight the Dream Stooges, Larry, Curly, and Moe, who, beyond the Three Stooges reference, are sort of ironic stand-ins for the id, ego, and superego. In FF7, when Tifa and Cloud fall into the livestream, they enter Cloud's unconscious memories. In traditional psychoanalysis, the analyst talks the patient through the process of naming their unconscious fantasies and attaching language to them so that they can work out their maladies and traumas. Encountering and working through trauma is one of the defining themes of the Final Fantasy games. FF characters always have a ton of psychological baggage. Cyan is tasked with seeing his family on the Phantom Train that carries the dead to the other side. Cloud goes through a whole wreck of trauma between the loss of his friend, the burning of his hometown, and Hojo's experiments messing with his memories. Cloud is basically broken, and his initial reaction to the trauma isn't the greatest. Zidane cracks when he finds out that he's a genome, a manufactured soulless being. In Final Fantasy X, spirits become vengeful if they can't overcome the trauma of their death, and Rex from Final Fantasy XII is so shaken by surviving the murder of his family that he's institutionalized. And then there's the sorry case of Vivi, the saddest little scarecrow in blackface in the history of gaming. His loss is not just the mourning of a friend or a loved one, it's something akin to Freud's discussion of melancholia. <laughs> of a self-directed sadness beyond object loss. What Vivi has lost can never be regained, the innocence of youth, of belief in immortality. Vivi finds out that he's just a mass-produced war doll with a shelf life of about a year. The mages just sort of wake up into consciousness, are thrown into the world like Frankenstein's monster, disconnected from their creator and radically without purpose. This existential quagmire is a microcosm for the human condition. As finite beings, we all grapple with the question, what does it mean to be a being that will one day die? How he's supposed to go on with this knowledge seems to be his central character arc, and the hint is there. The name Vivi is literally Italian for life, so the answer, find a way to live. One reaction to trauma is also the best part of soap operas. Amnesia. The way soap operas write characters that they've killed back onto the show is pretty hilarious. No, your favorite soap punk isn't really dead. He has amnesia or is really his evil twin. I wish that Final Fantasy were different, I really wish that it was. Going back over these games, the most frequent plot hole fix is, of course, Amnesia. In Final Fantasy VI, Terra can't remember being an Esper, and Rachel falls off a bridge and loses her memories. In VII, Cloud has all sorts of false memories. In Final Fantasy VIII, Selfie, Kesis, Cypher, Alone, Zell, and Squall were all somehow suppressing a memory of living in an orphanage together as kids. In Final Fantasy IX, Fratley is suffering from Amnesia, Garnett forgot a giant die in the sky that destroyed her city, and Fang, in Final Fantasy XIII, also has amnesia. But none of this compares to Titus. Yeah, we're going there again. What the fuck? Titus doesn't just have amnesia, he's forgotten that he isn't a real boy. He's actually a dream. 
I'm sorry, I just can't get over this. It's not that you're dreaming. You are a dream. When people think of the fantasy element of Final Fantasy, they often think of something like LARPing and the magic that gives it that fantasy feel. But lest we forget that some are decidedly sci-fi, the real fantasy that binds these games together is a struggle with trauma. Part 2, Bad Guys and Death Drive, and the Desire for Annihilation. While each big boss in the games have interesting justifications for their actions, most also act as a response to trauma. Looking for a way to explain the motivation of soldiers returning from World War I, afflicted with motivation that was inexplicable using his drives based on eros or sexuality, Freud coined the term the death drive, or death instinct, sometimes called thanatos. The death drive is an instinct or a drive towards self-destruction. It's a desire to return to inorganic chemistry, where all desires are satisfied. It is a desire to be free of conflict or suffering, kind of like curling up on a couch with some ice cream in Sherlock Forever. This manifests in a desire for for either self-annihilation or apotheosis, a desire to transform into a god. <laughs> and much like Prometheus, Phaethon, and Icarus, cutting corners on a path to divinity doesn't usually end well. In Final Fantasy IX, Kuja's response to his finitude and inevitable impending death is destroy all life with him in one blaze of glory. In Final Fantasy VII, Sephiroth is an abandoned and lonely soul that attempts to gain ultimate power by harnessing the life stream of the planet by hitting it with a giant meteor. Many of these antagonists justify their actions from the perspective of negative utilitarianism. Unlike traditional utilitarianism that attempts to maximize happiness, negative utilitarianism is all about minimizing suffering. And the surest way to ensure that there is net less suffering forever is to quickly snuff out all of life so that it can never suffer again. In Final Fantasy XIII, the Falci want to eliminate all disharmony and suffering by bringing back the Maker to reestablish order and peace. I will set you free! In Final Fantasy X, Seymour grew up with all the suffering, taunting, and harassment of being a half-breed, so his solution? Help Sin destroy Spira to end all suffering on the planet. If all life were to end in Spira, all suffering would end, don't you see? Part 3, The Environment and the World as Standing Reserve With all of the crystals in the Final Fantasy series, overlooking New Age spirituality would be a mistake. Exemplified by shops that sell incense, wind chimes, Australian didgeridoos, polished rocks, and a lot of crystals. The New Age movement gained traction in the 1970s and is an amalgam of spiritual beliefs that stress holistic divinity and the interconnectedness of all life. While not necessarily related to New Age spirituality, the Gaia hypothesis is similar in that it asserts that the Earth is one harmonious living system, and disrupting that system has serious implications for everyone living on the Earth. Final Fantasy seems to take a lot of inspiration from the Gaia hypothesis. In Final Fantasy VII, all life goes back to the planet as life stream. In Final Fantasy XII, IX, and VII, the planet is aptly named Gaia. Whether it's an evil corporation or a megalomaniac moving crystals or statues around, the game's focus on a balance with the environment, and as such, is full of environmentalist undertones. In VII, Cloud is in cahoots with an environmental terrorist group that challenges the exploitative Shinra Corporation. The Albed in Final Fantasy X are the last users of Machina, a type of technology, whereas most of the world is anti-technology. Sin is sort of like a mix between the Unabomber and the Sea Shepherd, if they were a giant whale beast thing. Its purpose for existence is to punish people for using technology, but to focus just on technology misses out on the root of the problem. Something more is going on than your usual Captain Planet tree hugger affair. Final Fantasy VII tips its hat with the introduction of a minor character, Heidegger. That's right, the notorious Martin himself, the master of being and time, makes an appearance as the head of public safety for the Shinra Corporation. In his work, The Question of Technology, Martin Heidegger asks, what is the essence of technology? Heidegger's answer, nothing technological. Rather, the drive to technology is based not in machines, but in a particular type of thinking and seeing called inframing. Inframing renders the totality of the field of vision, or the earth, to bestand, or standing reserve, as a matter simply waiting to be exploited for us. The way the Shinra Corporation merely sees life stream as a means to make the profitable substance Mako, or how Draclor Laboratories artificially creates Nethocyte, or how the Falci are enslaved to power the cities of Cocoon, or extracting magic from espers, are all examples of inframing. It stems from an inauthentic need to master and control the world, to settle the wilderness, to pacify the precocity of life by making everything needed ready at hand. However, the urge to mastery doesn't just end at objects. When humanity 
society views life from the perspective of instrumentality, human beings themselves are seen as standing reserve, as materials, as a means to an end. It's a form of objectification and subjugation. Throughout the entirety of the series, there are odd parallels between the world and politics of Final Fantasy and the fascist genocidal regimes of Earth. A couple of shared elements might be a coincidence, but Final Fantasy IV's murderous antagonist is called Golbez, which bears a striking resemblance to the Minister of Propaganda for the Nazi Reich, Paul Joseph Goebbels. Jewish imagery is also interspersed throughout the game. Sephiroth is close to Sephiroth, the Ten Attributes of God. Final Fantasy XIII takes place under the backdrop of the relocation and mass execution of the Lassi called the Purge. Lassi are a branded people chosen by the Falci gods, and Final Fantasy VII takes place under the guise that they will return to the Promised Land, complete with a Joseph Mengele-like character in the maniacal Hojo. Mengele, of course, was one of the Nazi doctors responsible for selecting people for the gas chambers and human experimentation in Auschwitz. Experimentation and objectification are constant themes in Final Fantasy. In VIII, Adia is possessed by Ultimisha to help advance her master plan to possess people in several timelines. Celeste is created through genetic engineering in Final Fantasy VI. In Final Fantasy XIII, Cocoon is a giant production facility to create human thralls for the Foul Sea. And just like prison sex, Kuja does what is done to him, creating a production facility of black mage dolls as weapons that reflect his own empty puppet-like existence as a genome. Also, trains. Final Fantasy VI has the Phantom Train, Seven has several trains, Eight has the Timber Train, Nine has an air cab that is a sort of monorail, Twelve has abandoned railroad tracks everywhere, and in 13, trains transport the sea to their mass extermination. The role of railroads are significant given the history of their use, for the acceleration of the mass exodus and elimination of people in Nazi Germany, and through facilitating the extermination of the native people of North America through the expansion of the western border into indigenous lands. Trains have always been a symbol of technological advancement. They stand as the archetype of the Industrial Revolution and Manifest Destiny. In Dostoevsky's The Idiot, trains were even a symbol of the Antichrist. As a sort of bad omen, trains are a reminder of the power of technology and the responsibility that comes with wielding immense power. Whether it be medieval times or space epics, in Final Fantasy, magic is treated pretty similar to technology, and in some instances they are used interchangeably. It isn't a question of technology or magic being bad in and of itself, their responsibility lies in the hands that use the tools or cast the spells. Conclusion Final Fantasy, in the end, is about the unbreakable human spirit, about overcoming impossible odds, of persevering when success seems like a pipe dream or a fantasy. It's about the power of friendship, love, and the transformative potential of hope. No one decides to sacrifice their lives in Final Fantasy X. They all choose to accept a world of death, suffering, and pain. All the party members in VII find a reason to fight for the planet. And in IX, the party fights against Necron and asserts a will to live. Even angst-filled Vivi finds the will to make little Vivi babies. And in Final Fantasy VI, they respond to Kefka's nihilism with it's the day-to-day -day concerns, personal victories, and the celebration of life and love that matters. Hey Wisecrack, thanks for watching. We're working on more great stuff for y'all, so be sure you subscribe to be notified the second new videos are released. And we want to let you know about a new sponsor of ours, Squarespace. Without these guys, you wouldn't be able to be seeing the videos you're watching right now. They're being really great in giving us the support to focus on what really matters, making quality videos for you. Squarespace has made it easy for anyone to make an awesome website, and they're giving you 10% off your first order when you use the offer code WISECRACK. With templates and easy-to-use tools, Squarespace has made it so simple to create the website that you want. Not convinced? Sign up today and you'll get a free 14-day trial so you can see for yourself. Make sure to use the offer code WISECRACK to get 10% off your order. In the meantime, I gotta go fuck up Nishandra for the Dark Souls video. Catch y'all next time. Peace.